And on June 14, 1946, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God gave us Trump. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, fix this country, work all day, fight the Marxists, eat supper, then go to the Oval Office and stay past midnight at a meeting of the heads of state. So God made Trump. I need somebody with arms, strong enough to rustle the deep state, and yet gentle enough to deliver his own grandchild. Somebody to ruffle the feathers, tame cantankerous World Economic Forum, come home hungry, have to wait until the first lady is done with lunch with friends, then tell the ladies to be sure and come back real soon, and mean it. So God gave us Trump. I need somebody who can shape an ax, but wield a sword, who had the courage to step foot in North Korea, who can make money from the tar of the sand, turn liquid to gold, who understands the difference between tariffs and inflation, will finish his 40-hour week by Tuesday noon, but then put in another 72 hours. So God made Trump. God had to have somebody willing to go into the den of vipers, call out the fake news for their tongues as sharp as a serpent's. The poison of vipers is on their lips, and yet stop. So God made Trump. God said, I need somebody who will be strong and courageous, who will not be afraid or terrified of the wolves when they attack, a man who cares for the flock, a shepherd to mankind who won't ever leave nor forsake them. I need the most diligent worker to follow the path and remain strong in faith and know the belief of God and country, somebody who's willing to drill, bring back manufacturing and American jobs, farm the lands, secure our borders, build our military, fight the system all day, and finish a hard week's work by attending church on Sunday. And then his oldest son turns and says, Dad, let's make America great again. Dad, let's build back a country to be the envy of the world again. So God made Trump. I am the chosen one. Somebody had to do it. They had to do it. I am the chosen one. Somebody had to do it. I am the chosen one. So we've got people lined up for questions. I just got one more, because you used the word Christian. Have you ever asked God for forgiveness? That's a tough question. I, I don't think in terms of, I have, I'm, I'm a religious person. Shockingly, because people are so shocked when they find this out. Uh, I'm Protestant, I'm Presbyterian. And I go to church and I love God and I love my church. And Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor. The power of positive thinking. Everybody's heard of Norman and I love my church. And Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor. The power of positive thinking. Everybody's heard of Norman Vincent Peale. He was so great. He would give a sermon you never wanted to leave. Sometimes we have sermons, and every once in a while we think about leaving a little early, right, even though we're Christian. <laughs> Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, Frank, would give, a survey, would give a sermon. I'm telling you, I still remember his sermons. It was unbelievable. And what he would do is he'd bring real-life situations, modern-day situations, into the sermon. And you could listen to him all day long. When you left the church, you were disappointed that it was over. He was the greatest guy. And then... You know, he passed away, but he was a great... The, the, he wrote The Power of Positive Thinking, which is but, a great book. But have you ever asked God for forgiveness? <laughs> I'm not sure I have. I just go and try and do a better job from there. I don't think so. I think I, if, I, if I do something wrong, I think I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. Now, when I take, you know, when we go and church and and when I drink my little wine which is about the only wine I drink and have my little cracker I guess that's a form of asking for forgiveness and I do that as often as possible because I feel cleansed okay but
Father, your word says, if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves and pray and seek your face, you will forgive their sins and heal their land. And we know we are people of prayer. So will you stretch your hands and pass and President Trump? These are some of your greatest faith leaders that would love to pray over you. Pastor Jensen's going to start. Apostle Maldonado. And uh, we love you. Will everybody just stretch your hands towards the president before he gets up? Because we know that prayer makes a difference. Let's all. Trump supporters are gathering in D.C. to protest. We will election. stop the steal. We're going to walk down to the Capitol, and I'll be there with you. They have been summoned by the president of the United States. We fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Couples breaking out as Trump supporters gather in support of his effort to stay in power. Madam Speaker, members of Congress, pursuant to the Constitution and the laws of the United States, Senate... Uh, they have stormed the U.S. Capitol and something else that should be noted, they have done so with ease. It happened very quickly that the mob ran over the first barricades that were really just bicycle racks and then ran up the steps. Stand aside and let us in, you traitors! This is the United States of America and we're watching protesters try to undermine the course of an election. The situation is getting out of control, but it is, has turned insane, frankly. I could not believe when they actually were able to shatter glass that I had assumed was bulletproof. They were able to wedge open what I thought was the strongest door on earth. Their goal, to overturn the presidential election. The GOP, Mitch McConnell. We're debating a step that has never been taken in American history. I've served 36 years in the Senate. This will be the most important vote I've ever cast. The mob was hunting Republicans who turned on Trump. It was the final chapter of Donald Trump's presidency. This is Donald Trump's America. We were warned over and over and over about it, and we ignored all of that. So here we are. He's got a gun! Donald Trump's presidency ended in a violent assault on American democracy. Just four years before, he stood at this very place, lighting the fire. And strike, 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 until you have victory. For every enemy that is aligned against you, let there be that we would strike the ground, for you will give us victory, God. I hear a sound of abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of shouting and singing. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. I hear a sound a victory. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. For I hear victory, 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 victory in the quarters of heaven, in the quarters of heaven. Victory, 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 victory. For angels are being released right now. Angels are being dispatched right now. Hamanda aka ata raka teda baka sanda ata ambo osa kata rite eke banda ata rike didi asha ta. For angels have even been dispatched from Africa right now. Africa right now. Africa right now. From Africa right now. They're coming here. They're coming here. In the name of Jesus from South America. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming here. They're coming here. From Africa. Over me. The teachings of St. Germain were taught by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. You are your instrument of those sevenfold rays and all your archangels, all of them. And I am the instrument of those sevenfold rays and archangels, and I will not retreat 
I will take my stand. We will not retreat. We will stand our ground. I will not fear to speak. We will not fear to speak. And I will be the instrument of God's will, whatever it is. We will be the instrument of your will, whatever it is. In the name of Archangel Michael and his legions, I am freeborn and I shall remain freeborn. In your name and the name of your legions, we are freeborn and we shall remain freeborn. And I shall not be enslaved by any foe within or without. And we shall not be enslaved by any foe within or without. So help me God. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you very much. So this, these are the seven fold rays that Michael Flynn is just talking about, which emanate from the great source. Helena Blavatsky identifies the first seven rays were the, she said they were the primeval celestial beings, variously called the primordial seven. Helena Blavatsky also said, it is Satan who is the God of our planet and the only God. And this is her magazine, Lucifer. So when Michael Flynn says, we are the instrument of your sevenfold rays, Whose sevenfold rays? Satan or Lucifer is that source. And C.W. Ledbetter, 33rd degree Freemason, he said they are the seven sublime lords of the secret doctrine, the primordial seven, the creative powers, the incorporeal intelligences, the Dihan Chohans, the angels of the presence, because they stand ever in the very presence of the Logos himself, representing their the rays of which they are the heads, representing us therefore, since every one of us is part of the divine life in every one of them. By Paul in Ephesians 6, 12, when he says, for we, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in the heavenly places. So what we have is Michael Flynn praying a prayer to the powers and principalities and the rulers of darkness in Hank Kuhneman's church with his congregation praying along with him. But I wouldn't really describe myself as religious today. I had never heard of things like mega churches or televangelism or the prosperity gospel. That was until I stumbled across an infamous interview. How are you, sir? We'd just like to ask you about why you don't want to fly commercial. You've got this journalist that is confronting this guy called Kenneth Copeland. You said that you don't like to fly commercial because you don't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. Get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Copeland is being confronted about his purchase of a Gulfstream jet. And it turns out that that jet is just one of a fleet of jets that he owns, along with a boathouse, a mansion, and his very own airport. This is a preacher that is supposedly worth hundreds of millions of dollars with an enormous following. And you're telling me that he is just one of many. <sighs> this entire thing is a rabbit hole. Pastor, what is now the largest church in America, weekly sermon watched by more than 10 million viewers on television. The apostles were businessmen. They were rich men, had plenty of money. I'm gonna show you that Jesus was a wealthy man, had plenty of money. One of my chandeliers cost more than most people's house. I got 22 chandeliers in the house. They're extremely greedy. They don't need mansions. They don't need jets. God told me to have that money. Any religious leader who speaks the word of God, who has more than one suit, while someone has no clothes, is a cop-out. Yeah, you know, Larry, I just don't see it that way. For $54 million, I want you to imagine how many people could be fed. Oh, well, ha, ha, ha. How many homeless could have places to sleep? Ha! <laughs> the fresh breath of all. Fresh, 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 fresh. You're hearing me. <laughs> 
while evangelism is still thriving in this country, if you were willing to pay the price, you could talk directly to God. When I remember my own personal experiences inside of a church, what comes to mind was definitely not this. At times, it's like a concert, and when the preachers come to preach, it's like a celebrity has just taken to the stage. Everyone is worshipping together, they're smiling, they're joined in their faith and devotion. What we're witnessing is something called a megachurch. By definition, a megachurch is just a church that has a larger than average congregation, normally of 2,000 members or above. But when we think of spirituality or, or forms of it, there's normally a distinction between spiritual duty and materialistic desires. Now, I'm not a theologian and I'm not gonna pretend to be one, but even I remember verses from the Bible when it came to wealth and, and building riches that it wasn't viewed favorably upon. But if my memory is correct, then what was I witnessing in this interview with Copeland? And moreover, some of these preachers. So you've got this preacher, Kenneth Copeland, who founded the Kenneth Copeland Ministries along with his wife, Gloria. They own a $7 million home, a fleet of jets, and their Eagle Mountain International Church has a membership in the thousands, not to mention their television and online broadcasting. Then there's Jesse Duplantis, who sat with Copeland as they both justified their purchases of private jets. And then the second one I, I purchased was in January, 2004. Benny Hinn, who claims to be able to perform miracles, who fills up stadiums and broadcasts it on networks worldwide. Release it, I'll release it. Joel Osteen, a very popular figure, especially in Houston, Texas, where his church resides, who's authored books that have been on New York Times bestsellers, as well as hosting church services with celebrities like Kanye West. Creflo Dollar, who has created fundraisers for his private jets, whose ministry owns two Rolls Royces and expensive real estate to boot. God is the gateway to the world of wealth. There's this Instagram page, which is called Preachers and Sneakers, and it's literally just preachers next to the cost of the clothing that they are wearing. Something, something just isn't right. I keep asking myself how, right? How is it possible to be this braggadocious about your wealth as a preacher and have your followers who not only are okay with it, but help to fund it? And that was when I found out about the prosperity gospel. What we're looking at is a movement that has seemingly found its way inside of America's biggest mega churches and being taught by its biggest preachers. The Word of Faith movement is its name and its teachings are often referred to as the prosperity gospel. It's a simple idea. God wants you to be prosperous through your finances, your health, your marriage and relationships. In fact, those are things that belong to you through your faith. If you are willing to receive it. The prosperity gospel often refers to its believers as little gods. The idea being that we were made in the image of God and therefore possess a level of divinity within us that allows us to bring into existence the prosperity that we've been promised. You are God's little G. You are God's because you came from God. And your DNA and Jesus' DNA are exact. You're exactly like it. You know? It sounds amazing. So how do I earn this prosperity? How do I access this divine power that I supposedly have? Well, it starts with your faith. But if you'll stay in faith, there will come a point where God will say, enough is enough, it's payback time. The Bible says, I know you love the Lord. So you, you qualify for, for prosperity. Next, you have the act of tithing. The initial concept of tithing was this idea that you give one-tenth of your wealth in some way, shape or form to a religious organization. Most houses of worship are going to rely on the donation of their congregation in order to continue their operations, especially mega churches. It is kind of like giving to a charity, but tithing through the teachings of the prosperity gospel introduces a, should we call it a plot twist? Tithing lays the foundation for financial success and abundance. Tithing is the way for recession or depression to bypass you. Here, Stephanie from Maryland writes, I sent in my first fruits offering. Two weeks later, I received, watch this, $2,400. So now it isn't just about donating your money to a church. It becomes a case where you're exchanging your money in return for actual prosperity. You'll often hear some of these prosperity preachers refer to it as sowing your seed. 
The implication is pretty obvious to anyone who is watching. No, you give us some of your money and in return that value will be given back to you in some way, shape or form. It's the harvest. I want you to go to the phone or online and sow a seed. Now remember, somebody's son is going to be set free from alcohol because of your thousand dollar seed. And I'm going to ask you to sow an exceptional and uncommon seed of one thousand dollars and click on that donation button to sow one thousand one hundred forty four dollars so god is giving you the harvest and the harvest of the seed you sow you can't expect the harvest if you don't sow seed spiritual physical or financial so it's surreal and it generates a lot of money on January the 12th of 2008, Kenneth Copeland Ministries took possession of a Gulfstream jet, which was funded all thanks to the donors of his church. In fact, KCM wrote a blog post thanking their followers for helping them, quote, harvest the Gulfstream. But our work is not done. To which the blog then proceeds to remind their followers that they still need 17 million more dollars, which will be used for the quote, sewing towards the construction of a new hangar, upgrading the existing runway and purchasing special Gulfstream maintenance equipment. Or how about Creflo Dollar's infamous sermon to which he tells his congregation to help him fundraise towards a private jet, all to the response of cheers and applause from the audience. If I want to believe God for a $65 million plane, you cannot stop me. You cannot stop me from dreaming. See, Copeland and Dollar's pleas for money, they're not met with criticism and backlash from their congregation. It's celebrated. And prosperity preachers will obviously say that this aids in their quest to spread their message across to different countries. If I flew commercial, I'd have to stop 65% of what I'm doing. Conveniently, that message obviously allows them to make even more in donations. But these preachers, they don't just live lavish, right? They, they put it on full display. You think Jesus Christ would roll around in a Rolls Royce? Uh, I think he would. Let's get a close up of Gloria's ring. Where am I looking? Right here. Um, you fly in a private plane. Yes, I You're do. You're staying right now in one of the fanciest hotels yes, in New York City. Yes, I am. You wear nice very clothes. nice clothing. So... Money! Money! Come on! Come in! Come in! To me! Now! The wealth of these preachers, they're not seen as gross or hypocritical. In fact, they're seen of proof that the teachings work. It's seen as them actually practicing what they preach. The extravagant lifestyle, that's not a mistake or a flaw. It's a feature of the prosperity gospel. Many of these preachers will say that the funds that they received are used only for ministry purposes. Osteen, for example, says that he doesn't receive any salary from his ministry and all the money he makes comes from his book sales. Look, in some ways, I don't really care if a ministry wants to buy a private jet. It looks optically hypocritical, but I'd rather let theologians argue over the contradictions that those actions have with actual religious texts. I'm more interested in how the money is generated, and it doesn't get more unethical of a promise than it does with the prosperity gospel. If you're accustomed of giving $10, go to 20. Go up to 70, 80, 100. Raise that amount and watch what God will do because don't you stop sowing offerings well they won't let us go to church well email it in there text and give or something you get that tithe in that church you get that offering in that church and then you go home and you do what we're supposed to do Church of Laodicea is the Laodicea is right in other words again let's start with the name of the letter Leo means people right? Remember the Nicolaitans, the rule over the people. Here we have people as rulers. This is ruled by the people. Some people say, gee, that's a word that sort of suggests democracy. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But the real point is, who is supposed to be ruling the church? I haven't heard anyone give me the right answer. The Son of God, you betcha. Jesus is to rule the church. Uh, there's no instruction that I can find in the Scripture for us to do, uh, you know, market research and do user-friendly... I, can't, I, I, I noticed John the Baptist didn't worry about being a user-friendly preacher, but we'll move on. Uh, the title of Christ. This is, now, Jesus takes of himself then, uh, in each of these letters, a title typically drawn from chapter 1, one of, the, one of the seven elements there. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. There's three epithets here. Um, and uh, the... Uh, it's interesting how Jesus just draws upon his foundational character. He's going back to basics here in this letter. 
He is the Amen. That's a word, that's a Hebrew word, by the way. It means true, verily. And uh, we find it all through the Bible. We also uh, find passages where uh, it speaks of that which is true, and often the Amen isn't necessarily at the end. We use it like a salutation at the end of a prayer. No, sometimes right in the middle of, um, of Paul's letters, you'll say the you know, Amen, you know. And it's also a style in many fellowships that when you find, when the, when the uh, speaker says something that strikes a responsive chord, we get a spontaneous amen. And uh, that's a style that uh, is, is, is not unscriptural. But uh, it means true verily. It, Jesus Christ is the one, the true one. The amen. He is the faithful and true witness. Both these phrases, by the way, are drawn from chapter 1. But they also echo throughout the whole scripture. And I was originally going to go through some of these but I don't think I need to for this group for two reasons. First of all, this is basic. I'm assuming most of you either have or can track down these verses to get a flavor of what, uh, of, of these, uh, this foundational character of Jesus Christ. But I also want to preserve some time because I have a, something I want to do at the end to wrap this all up and we'll run short of time if I take too much time with this area. So the beginning of the creation of God. This is a very strange expression to many. And uh, so, uh, G-G, Jesus wasn't created. What does this mean? The word um, arche is uh, really uh, means beginning or first origin or first cause. It's also an allusion for the ruling power or the authority. It's, the, it's an allusion to the creator who began the creation of God. And uh, so the term is used of rank and honor. One of the reasons that wanted to catch your eye here, this is a very unusual construction. It occurs here in Laodicea, and it also occurs in the letter to the Colossians. And uh, I'll come back to that before we're through this evening. And uh, Paul had specifically instructed both Colossians and Laodicea to trade letters, and uh, because the, 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 the Gnostic errors were emerging about that time throughout that valley, and those letters, as well as Ephesians, are rebuttals to the Gnostic error. They deal with the, the, the deity of Jesus Christ, and so forth. Now, we then come to the concerns. Uh, did you notice something missing? There are no commendations. Normally there's the commendations first. There aren't any. I, saw, I was going to insert a little blank page just to make that point, but you get the idea. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold nor hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, there are a lot of people that try to figure out, well, gee, that means you should be either cold or hot. And, uh, and, and it's, it's kind of fun to read some of those attempts to apply that because, uh, well, gee, then the, the ones that are lukewarm must be the carnal Christians. Okay, then uh, who are the ones that are hot? That he doesn't, you know, and who are the ones that are cold? And you start playing with that, it doesn't work, okay? And I don't think that's, what, that's the point at all. What Jesus is using is he's drawing an idiom from the local scene to point out that they need to be palatable. If they're lukewarm, he's going to spew them out. Can you imagine Jesus saying of you, I'm going to spew you out of my... That, that's as about as... Re, that, that sounds like rejection to me, I think. Yeah, okay. And uh, so, I know thy works. That you can't hide from God. It, this, this, this echoes in each of the letters. And uh, so, here, Jesus is saying... You guys at Laodicea are like an emetic. I'm going to spew you out. And uh, uh, not everyone, let's go to Matthew 7 to give you an echo of this. Not everyone, Jesus says, that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? What will Jesus say? He says, that I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So this is obviously their rejection. And Jesus goes on to amplify that in verse 17 of chapter 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. By the way, do you realize, you know, I don't, many of you probably watch Christian television. And there's a number of these guys that um, are on the air that uh, are sometimes called the name it and claim it guys. The blab it and grab it guys. You know, God wants you to be wealthy. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Well, that's your news to Paul. Um, the, uh, God didn't intend you to be sick. You should be, if you're sick, it's because you don't have enough faith and all this, you know. So, 
Um, I never realized that those guys that preach that way on television are scriptural. Do you realize that? Sure, they're right out of Revelation 3, verse 17. They say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Really? And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And I'll forego the temptation to give you 17 Bible verses on each one of those to track down. You can do that on your own with things. But basically, obviously, this is a... This is another example that we see all through the seven letters where the perception of the church was wrong. The churches that thought they were doing poorly were doing well. The ones that thought they were doing well were doing terribly. That should be sobering to every one of us. Every one of these churches needed a perspective of Jesus Christ, needed to be corrected in that direction. So what's Jesus' exhortation uh, in response to all of this? He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And it was not the kind of gold you're trading in. He's using it idiomatically, of course. That thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. He's not talking about white wool either. He's using that as an idiom, of course. That, your shame, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Now these are idioms that are, were familiar to the local uh, people. Because he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So the remedies, their blindness and nakedness were not incurable. He says you're blind, wretched, and so forth. He suggests the ultimate refiner offers his gold. You find that in Psalm 19 and all through the Scripture. The, the, we, we saw we sing refiner's fire and so forth. The bridegroom offers his covering, white raiment, not the blossy, raven-colored, black uh, wool, if you will. And the great physician offers his remedy to really open their eyes with he says, I salve. He's using it idiomatically. He's not the I salve. He's talking about, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, so they can behold and see. Then we get to verse 20. Now, this verse is a verse that is probably one of the most quoted verses out of the book of Revelation. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. How many have heard that verse before? Sure, we all heard it many, many times, typically by an evangelist at an altar call. Be, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the no door and knock, and indeed He does. And if any man, any one of you, Mr. and Mrs. Man, hear my voice and open the door, the door has only, the knob is only on the inside, okay? Open the door. I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. I love that phrase. You know, Jesus never appears after His resurrection without eating. This is one of the examples. But anyway, uh, my kind of guy. I will sup with him and he with me. Now, taken out of context... This is a great invitation, the kind of invitation you use for an altar call, get people to come down and make a decision for Jesus Christ. Praise God. That's exciting. However, where this verse stands is the final indictment of the church at Laodicea. Why? Where is Jesus with respect to the church of Laodicea? He's outside we had introduced in chapter 1 and echoed all through the chapters 2 and 3 that Jesus has the churches in His hand and He is in the midst of them. Jesus is in the midst of us right now, praise God. Not here. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And say, the, pro the commitment here is not to the church. It's to that individual that just might hear and receive Christ. In spite of the church, not because of it, is my suggestion. Then he has a promise to the overcomer. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Wow. Is Jesus on his throne right now? No, he's not. That says a lot here. I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. This should clarify some confusion about Christ's throne. Christ was promised a throne. Gabriel told Mary that he would get a throne. What throne was that? David's throne. He's not on David's throne today. He never has been. He will be. He's on his father's throne. We're going to talk a lot about thrones next time because the next time we meet, we're going to go into the throne room of the universe and we're going to see firsthand what's really going on there. So my father and his throne, that's next time. 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says church, uh, to the churches. And here we have the, ca- the salutation at the end. That he that hath an ear phrase has occurred seven times in the book of Revelation so far. It also has occurred seven times in the Gospels. And we're going to examine where shortly, in just a minute. But let's remember who the overcomer is. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So, okay, we had Laodicea's name, their title, their, their concerns, exhortation. Obviously, there's something that's scathingly uh, omitted. There's no commendation whatsoever for two of the um, churches. Sardis and Laodicea. Strangely enough, would be the two that most characteristic, characteristically describe the churches today. And I don't just mean in America. You think we've got problems here? You should go to some of these other countries where they used to have a dynamic church and today they're empty shells of formalism and, and totally devoid of the Spirit of God, it would seem. Okay. There is an inscription on a church in Germany that I couldn't resist using to wrap up Laodicea. This inscription appears apparently on a church in Germany, at Lübeck, uh, Germany. Thus speaketh Christ our Lord to us. You call me master, and obey me not. You call me light, and see me not. You call me way, and walk me not. You call me life, and choose me not. You call me wise, and follow me not. You call me fair, and love me not. You call me rich, and ask me not. You call me eternal, and seek me not. You call me noble, and serve me not. You call me gracious, and trust me not. You call me might, and honor me not. You call me just, and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. The first group have the promises to the individual postscripted. The last four the promises to the overcomer are in the body of the letter. And they also make explicit reference to the second coming. So we have the medieval church that has a promise that they, if they don't repent, they'll be cast to the great tribulation. We have the missionary church, Philadelphia, promised that they will not go into the tribulation. And we have two that are ambiguous that will leave to your own suggestion, the denominational church and the apostate church today. All these churches apply, all these letters apply to all churches. Let's remember that. Let's not pin, you know, uh, labels on any particular church. Like Ephesus, of course, the issue there was devotion, not just doctrine. They were doctrinally sharp, but they didn't have... Too busy on the, t- uh, uh, on the business of the king to have time for the king. Smyrna simply endure persecution. That's the persecuted church. And it, while I believe it does refer to Smyrna in, that, in those early centuries under Roman persecution, there are more Christians under persecution today than ever before in history, in numbers. There are more Christians murdered in the 20th century than all the previous centuries put together. Pergamos, the married church. There are many churches beside the Vatican that are married in one way or other to the world. Paganism is everywhere. And the, we are to stand fast against the world as a church. Thyatira is also told to abandon pagan practices. They had the woman Jezebel and all of that. Sardis, they were dead. We're admonished there for watchfulness and diligence to make sure that does not apply to us. Philadelphia, will call it the missionary outreach, evangelism. And I think the model of that in the coming decade is the home fellowship, as it always has been. If you want to know what I mean by that, get our briefing package called the Once and Future Church. I think there, God has always puts new wine and new skins, and the, the, I think we're going to see wine now being put back in the kinds of skins they were way, way back then. Around There's a groundswell of home fellowships, and that's the, that I think the Lord is preparing the body to go underground. And then, of course, we have Laodicea, which for lack of a better term, I'll just say prosperous compromise. They compromise with the world because of their prosperity, and that's an affliction that affects us all. We all take comfort, too much comfort, in riches and our wherewithal and so forth. 
You say, well, gee, I'm out of a job right now. Yeah, but you're still better off than most people in the world. 